much. Welcome, everyone. And I see we have a need for bridging. And lucky you, it seems like I am the bridge, uh, uh, serving as a bridge here in multiple roles in terms of bridging the private and public sector. We also need to bridge micro and macro, and we need to bridge disciplines. Um, we are even building a bridge between your restaurant in downtown and your lunch being served. So literally speaking, I'm the sandwich between the two. Um, and so what we haven't talked about yet in, in that theme of capitalism and society is actually corporations and the world of academia. All right, so let me get started. Oops. Excellent. So let me get started and take the view of the corporations at this moment. Okay? From the company's perspective, from a big picture point of view, the key question is, does companies, do companies' social and environmental responsible practices help improve their competitiveness? The short answer to this question seems to be, yes, they can. Not always. Of course not always. But they can. And specifically, you can see this along several dimensions. First of all, companies' social and environmental responsible practices can help foster innovation and prevent knowledge leakage, to enhance employee governance, as we just heard also today, in terms of the restaurants, the employees in the restaurants, right? surprise, surprise, if you actually treat your employees well, you're more likely to be able to attract talent, to motivate talent, and to retain talent. Um, Companies' social and environmental responsible practice can also help companies differentiate themselves from their competitors on the, on the product market as well as on the market for government procurement contracts. And so, as a result, it's perhaps not surprising that these practices can also help sustain their competitiveness during times of economic crisis. There's also related uh, uh, research that has shown that during the recent COVID crisis, that companies uh, that have performed better in terms of their environmental social practices, they have become, or they have been more resilient. Okay? So as a result, if you take this into account, it is perhaps not surprising that companies' social environmental responsible practices can positively affect shareholders' perception and shareholders' returns. So the bottom line is, companies' E and S practices can be beneficial to companies. Again, not always, but on average, they can. This begs then the question is, the, uh, the, this begs then the question, why then do these practices, um, uh, why are they not core to company strategy and company's governance, okay? Why? Well, one potential reason is that there's a lack of long term rotation and a lack of good corporate governance practices, such as um, a lack of, as I said, a lot, lack of long term rotation and a lack of private incentives to care about these issues. And so, for example, in two related studies, we showed that well, uh, well designed governance practices, such as executive compensation, that is tied to long term financial performance, not short term, but longer term financial performance as well as executive compensation that is tied to social and performance outcomes that this not only improves the sustainable business practices, but also from value. So in other words, the E and S of E, S and G are not separate, as is often considered to be the case, but rather an integral part of G. For the economists in this room, G is a function of E and S. Okay? So, now, before I delve deeper into these studies about private incentives, let me take a step back and look at recent developments in the, in the business environment. I don't need to tell you that um, companies are increasingly faced with risks and costs of climate change. You can see this in the increase in energy demand, damage of course to property and infrastructure. We can also see this in the decrease in public health, uh, water supply, agricultural production, etc. Companies also face increasing uh, pressure from governments to take actions. Okay? So governments increasingly um, uh, realize we need to take actions and regulate. For example, is the Paris Agreement 
in which 195 nations um, agreed to limit global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. Third, and we just heard this before, there is increasing social pressure on companies to take actions um, and to be more responsible. And this pressure is intensified with the use of social media. Just to give you two examples, for example, BlackRock was targeted as the largest driver of current destruction in a relatively recent campaign, but well, that was 2018. Pretty sure we could find a more, uh, more recent newspaper about this as well. And another article shows you that social activists make pressure on investors to divest from uh, companies that plunder the Amazon. Okay? Perhaps as a result of these different trends going on, it's not surprising that um, investors, the company shareholders, increasingly care about these practices of the portfolio companies. We can see this reflected in various ways. For example, uh, uh, shareholders increasingly want their portfolio companies to adopt a longer time orientation, to improve their sustainable business practices, to disclose their exposure to climate change risks, for example, and um, etc., etc. And so you can also see this trend reflected in the increasing number of signatories of the Principal Responsible Investing Network, which is the larger network of responsible investors. Now, just to give you a sense of this increasing interest among shareholders and investors in this environment and social practices of their portfolio companies, let me show you a little bit of data. So I'm looking here at ENS proposals, so CSR proposals, related to environmental issues, sustainability report, the addition of uh, minorities and women to the board, animal rights, health issues, human rights, labor issues, etc., etc. These were shareholder proposals submitted to the annual meeting uh, to address these uh, aspects. Now, what you can see here, and you can tell this data is a little bit outdated, so I should update it, but the trend has all obviously intensified over the years, so between the years 1997 to 2012, there has been a tremendous increase in the number of shareholder proposals submitted to companies and the percentage of approval and the average vote has come. Yes, they are desperately low, but they have improved over time. Okay? And increasingly so now in the last decade. Now, you might wonder, what are these proposals about? Well, many of them are about environmental issues and labor issues. In most recent years, there has also been an increase in, uh, in terms of social inequality, the addition of minorities and women to the board, as well as uh, the, 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 um, the disclosure of sustainability reports. Okay? You might wonder who are these investors who care about environmental and social aspects and submit these proposals? Who are the lead investors submitting these proposals? But the most active investors, um, but also phenomenally unsuccessful in terms of getting the support and vote from the other investors, are religious groups. Okay? Similarly active, but uh, more successful in getting broader support of other investors, are actually public pension funds and sustainable responsible investing funds. All right, so all to say, and I hope this uh, uh, signals to you that over time, investors have increasingly shown interest and pressure their portfolio companies to um, uh, improve their sustainable business practices. And just as a uh, side note here, so what I do find is those companies that actually adopt better practices show better uh, financial performance, meaning it helps increase their fund value. All right, so, okay, let's take this all together. Increasing uh, costs and risks of climate change, increasing government regulation, increasing social media pressure, increasing investor pressure. Well, I think it's fair to say that the efficacy and the pressure um, for improved business practices has intensified over the years. As a result, this may have triggered some boards of directors to reconsider their corporate governance <coughs> practices and to adopt new corporate governance practices to improve not only their sustainable business practices, but also their firm value. And two of these practices are the linking of executive compensation to long-term financial performance, and another one is the linking of compensation to social and environmental performance. And let me briefly touch on those 
uh, 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 very briefly. So first, let me uh, devote a little bit of time on time compensation to long-term financial performance. Okay? What we need to understand is that in many countries, the disclosure of non-financial information, which includes E and S information, is voluntary. It is not mandated by law. As a result, many companies do not disclose this information, and if they do, in a non-standardized fashion. Now, there has been a lot of progress, a lot of, uh, also at the policy level, which is very exciting, a lot of debate about whether and how uh, uh, governments or stock exchanges could make it mandatory to disclose this type of information. But at this very moment, in many countries around the world, it's still voluntary. Second of all, we also know from a very large literature in economics and psychology that individuals, so not just managers, but in individuals more generally, are so-called hyperbolic discounters. Meaning, on average, individuals have a preference for the short term over the long term, and so they would choose to invest in a shorter term project and pays off in the short term, as opposed to in a longer term strategy, even if that longer term investment strategy would be beneficial for the company. Okay? We term this as a time-based agency conflict, where especially now for managers, so I just talked about individuals in general, but for managers, this myopic behavior is further enforced through, for example, short-term compensation, quality earnings expectations, career concerns, etc. Think about it in the US, you can be fired any time. Right? So, of course, it puts your attention to the, uh, to, to the short term, trying to meet your quality and expectations. So, again, as I mentioned, we call this uh, the time-based agency conflict, where managers um, are even shorter term oriented than their investors, and hence might not act in the best interest of their companies. Unless they are intensified up there, incentivized otherwise. For example, by providing compensation that is tied to longer term financial performance. All right, let me move to the other somewhat newer corporate governance practice, and this is the tying of compensation to social and environmental performance criteria. Um, this uh, is a relatively new phenomenon, so where compensation is tied, for example, to specific CO2 emission targets, employee satisfaction targets, uh, compliance with ethical standards in developing countries, etc., etc. This practice has different names. Some of them call it ESG-linked compensation, even though what they really mean is ES-linked compensation, uh, CSR contracting, or pay for social and environmental performance. Okay? Now, Going back to what I said before, we know that uh, individuals in general are myopic. Managers tend to be even more myopic because of career concerns and short-term uh, performance, uh, compensation, etc., etc. So they have somewhat of a tendency to prefer investment strategies that pay off in the short term over the long term. In addition, managers face many, many demands from stakeholders, from their various constituencies, and these interests and demands might collide with each other. So you might have, for example, employees who care about their wage and, and how well they are uh, um, being treated, while consumers care about the price, correct? And so who do you listen to? Under, in a world where you have limited resources, financing constraints, who do you listen to? Whose needs and interests are you catering to? If you combine this with a somewhat myopic behavior, you as a manager are probably going to end up focusing on the most more salient stakeholders, meaning, for example, employees and customers, more so than, for example, natural environment and local communities who cannot really speak up for themselves or are not um, necessarily having direct short term financial performance implications. So, to address this, to direct the attention of managers to these stakeholders who might very much be valuable and material to the companies to firm value, but in the, in the long term, not necessarily in the short term, what all of the directors can do is uh, tie the compensation to the social and environmental performance goals. Obviously, it doesn't come without caveats. It's very tricky to understand which metrics should you tie it to. 
and uh, how to assess, etc., etc. But this is one potential tool. Okay. So what are the key findings of these studies? Well, the time of compensation to either uh, longer-term financial performance criteria or to social and environmental performance criteria, on one hand, helps improve the firm's sustainable business practices and their innovativeness. It also um, increases their long-term operating performance. In the long term, not necessarily in the short term. Again, if the time horizon of the manager is not long enough, she or he might not understand that a certain strategy would be very much valuable to the company um, and so therefore not investing in it. Okay? And lastly, it also helps increase shareholder value. Alright, so what does this mean? Why should we even care about this? What are the implications for practice? Well, these insights suggest that corporate short termism is really hampering business success. Absent proper incentives, managers tend to underinvest in long term strategies, which not only hurts the company and the investors, but perhaps more importantly, society and the environment. And that the E and S of E, S, and G are not separate but rather an integral part of the governance of the company. Alright, now the key question is so, ESG, poor values, and as you know, uh, speaking of social media, ESG has certainly been under attack uh, in, the, in the past few weeks. So, where are we going here, from here? Let me get back to the various system level challenges we are facing in this world. Climate change, biodiversity loss, social inequality, <coughs> poverty, I mean you can really pick your favorite crisis here, right? The typical response of many of us in this room is it's the government's role to fix this crisis and to regulate. Most likely this will be the first best solution. Unfortunately though, when you look outside of the window, this is whatever the governments are doing, it's just not sufficient to help address this crisis because otherwise we wouldn't be in the midst of these various crises. And this puts the spotlight on the private sector. What can the private sector do to help mitigate some of these crises and to what extent? Okay? Now the current practices of ESG be it in the financial sector or in the private sector, are essentially very much confined to the firm level or the portfolio level. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, if we take, for example, climate change and the disclosure of climate risk, which is currently uh, debated at uh, the SEC, for example, there is much debate about making it mandatory to disclose scope one and scope two, not necessarily scope three. So scope one is direct emissions of companies, scope two are basically those of uh, the energy you consume, and scope three is the, the uh, uh, carbon footprint of your suppliers and your consumers. Okay? Now, clearly, scope three is very, very hard to assess, and it's not under direct control of the full firm. So, you know, there are uh, arguments for saying, let's just make it mandatory to discuss scope one and scope two, not scope three. Clearly, it would already be an enhancement, an improvement of the status quo, where we are uh, now, because we don't have any mandatory disclosure at all. But if we don't consider scope three, what likely happens is that companies start divesting their most emission intensive operations, scope one becomes scope three, on file, what we assess how a company performs in terms of their E, looks like the company cleaned up its act, but nothing has changed with respect to climate change because all it did is really divest their climate change to some supply. Similarly, we can make an example with diversity, equity, inclusion. A very sensitive, a very important topic, especially in the US. Well, I shouldn't say topic, issue. Now, the current way we assess companies as social performance in this dimension is, for example, how many women and minorities do you have on board? How many women and minorities do you have in top management? What this likely leads to is a reshuffling of talent between one top company to the other top company, from one Ivy League school to the other Ivy League school. But it does not mean that it increases the accessibility 
and social mobility and allows more women and minority to get into the system and move up the ladder. Okay? So what we currently have is not sufficient. Another example, and I'm not going to bother you with too many examples, but I think it's, it's worthwhile to think about those things. Um, modern portfolio theory. Hmm. Now the room is silent. <laughs> um, if you think about it, there's no such thing like hatching climate risks. It's quite stupid if you think about it. What you can do is hatch the risk of your portfolio towards the news of climate change in the short term. But this does not take into account the long-term implications of your investments on climate change, nor does it take into account the, lot, the increase in costs and risks of climate change on your portfolio's performance. Okay? What we assume in this theory is that systemic risks are exogenous, not endogenous. Okay, I, I, think I'm, I, I think I made my point here. What we need is new theories. We need new practices. So there are two key missing links. One is many theories, and now I'm coming to kind of academia, but it also obviously applies to practice. Our thinking, in, um, our thinking is very much stuck at the portfolio level or at the firm level. We don't consider the system, that bridge between system level challenges and the firm level or the portfolio level. So what we really need is to account for what is the risk exposure of companies and investors to these system level uh, challenges, but vice versa also, what are the potential opportunities and uh, uh, risk uh, returns um, of the system and uh, um, what are the implications for the business. Okay? What is also very missing, very often missing, is the bridging between the public and the private sector. If you look at in, uh, finance, that would be blended finance. In order to address many of these system level challenges, the typical way of having funded climate change by diversity laws, social inequality, etc., has been through public funding. Yet we know to, for example, transition to a low carbon economy, there's an enormous financing gap. What has kicked in, in practice, is the use of blended funding, where, for example, public funding provides almost like a seed grant, that helps attract cap private capital, and helps mitigate close this finance gap. We're still facing enormous finance gap. Okay? When you look at academia, there's very little work about this blending approach. Also, typically, what we assume is, give, uh, you know, assuming a set of regulations and rules, what is the ideal strategy for companies? What is the ideal investment strategy given a set of policies? What we don't often ask is how can companies and investors positively engage with policymakers, uh, legislators, standard setters, and help shape the rules and trigger systemic change. Okay? So going back to my example about, for example, metrics, what we assess is, for example, how companies treat their own employees, which is important. What we don't really assess is how do companies lobby the government for labor laws. Thinking about the US, the latest LGBTQA uh, um, policies that were put in place, right? So at the company level, very often these are two different divisions that don't necessarily speak to each other. The corporate sustainability officer in their department and then the lobbying is done in a different department. Okay? So again, there is work on non in non-market strategy in research, so-called non-market strategy, but the focus is very much on how can companies, to what extent can companies engage in campaign contributions, lobbying efforts, etc., for the benefit of the company. We are not asking the question, how does that benefit society and the environment? So for all the PhD students in the room, I hope this gives you food for thought and lots of research uh, ideas. Okay, so what do we need? We need it to adopt a systems focused approach where we take into account this interrelationship between the system level challenges and the firm level slash the portfolio level. 
we also need to develop metrics that allow us to assess and track progress towards mitigation of these system level challenges. And we need to create public private partnerships. So, the exciting thing is, what well, I'm particularly excited, so the, uh, the last speak, uh, speech ended on a fairly, fairly um, negative, low, pessimistic note. Let me end on a positive note here. What I'm very excited about is here at Columbia we launched a new initiative with the mission to foster scholarship, education, and dialogue on system level investing, um, consisting of five pillars. That is, one hand, development of better metrics, the, the, the fostering of academic scholarship, rigorous academic scholarship that takes into account these different relationships. Because if we want to change our theories and frameworks that we are teaching in school, so now I'm putting the focus on us and our responsibility, we need a change of theories. And to do this, we need rigorous academic work that gets published in top tier journals and eventually becomes knowledge, academic knowledge, that hopefully eventually gets translated into our textbooks that we teach in school. Then the organization of conferences bring together key players from policy, industry, policy uh, um, investors, <coughs> and academics to discuss um, these issues and inform each other. And the last part is education. The education of future leaders in business and investing and policy, as well as the education uh, of the current leaders. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Yes, hello, my name is Alfredo Navarrete. I am currently working for the Ministry of Finance in Mexico, and we're trying to develop right now the taxonomy in order to measure and to have like, metrics for the financial system. But one thing that uh, we still have to do is to implement this taxonomy. So uh, I have the, the first question would be, do you in the US have this taxonomy already established for financial products? And my second question is that, who is going to give me the certificate that I have a, an, an, an SG program and that I have a score point and all these ESG things it, so that the market can know that I am a clean company or, or whatever, or that I am investing in, 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 in ESG companies. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, if, if, if you were to look outside to see who has implemented it, I would not. I hope I'm not. Are you recording this? <laughs> <laughs> I would not look at the US. The US is not a leader when it comes to ESG or sustainable business practice. I'm very sorry for saying so. Um, I would look at Europe. Um, it's all in process. It's all in process, but I would say European countries are really taking the lead here. In terms of the certification, you are, you are uh, answer, asking an important question, correct? In, the, in absence of public governance, in absence of regulation, how can you differentiate, for example, green water, greenwashers from those who are really serious about it? How can you trust those scores, for example? What has kicked in is private governance in terms of independent third third party certifiers, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, which helps in terms of the governance and helps mitigating greenwashing, but greenwashing is clearly a, an enormous concern. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But I'm also happy to connect you with some networks. Great. Okay, <laughs> let's talk offline. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much. That was great. Uh, I'm Bob Hurley. I teach at Ford and I do research on organizational trustworthiness. Um, if you were to look at Wells Fargo, Boeing, um, Goldman Sachs, all these major massive trust violations, what you'd find is that it was generally the root cause was ex exogenous pressure. Stock price, right? And so if you look at the, the, at the uh, activist numbers, it's pitiful how many people are voting in favor of this. So what that tells me is that the relative power of the exogenous pressures is, has an asymmetry. 
So one way to think about it is you have to restructure the exogenous pressures to force organizations into an adaptive mechanism to do what it is you're trying to do. How would we do that? We could do it through regulation, but then people might argue that that is going to lead to less dynamism. Oh, I thought you gave me the solution here. No, no, <laughs> I asked a good question. No, this, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer, correct? But in a sense, of the, there are lots of, lots of opportunities of bridging. Bridging in terms of understanding corporations can play an active role in helping inform and positively shape I'm not saying against climate policy, but in favor of designing climate policy also, quite for example. Um, I don't have an answer. I literally don't have an answer. Thank you. Um, you just mentioned at the end that uh, Europe is uh, taking the lead in terms of ESG investing. Uh, I'm from Europe. Uh, uh, at present, I think they're very busy in trying to get as much energy from wherever, from whichever source, increasing the capacity of coal-fired power stations, bringing them back and gas fired and so on. So I'm not sure whether that is going to be true in the next few years. So which countries are you referring to when you say they're taking the lead? It's certainly not the largest economy, the Germans, because they are fighting to get energy wherever from. Well, energy is one aspect. Right? So if, if we are thinking about, so I, I don't necessarily want to only focus on climate because obviously climate also interrelates with social inequality, poverty, etc., and biodiversity loss. But if you, if we look at now, for example, climate, energy is only one aspect, one contributor to climate. Um, I would say leading of corporations. Um, that have been active in sustainable investing, I would say UK, France, Germany, Netherlands. Um, but obviously, you know, facing so many ch challenges in this world, including the war in the Ukraine, Russia, it's tricky, correct? It's very complex. Um, and how to transition to a low carbon economy without worsening social inequality, but still ensuring access to energy. Should I say again? I don't have the answer. <laughs> I only have questions. But in a sense of it, it does point towards we need to sit at the same table. We, we, this, this question cannot just be answered by political scientists or governments. Companies need to come to the table. Um, sociologists need to come to the table and, and, and hopefully develop a solution. Um, I, I know that's not a satisfactory answer. We'll just do a few more. Here's one more. We'll do two. Hi, can I just ask you, as an economist, um, so carbon emissions are an externality. Um, how can it be that you're finding that companies make more money if they voluntarily internalize the costs of that externality rather than free riding on it? Or is it just that you're saying they should act ahead of government action? Um, which you, you appear to regard as inevitable. There are different ways. Um, on one hand, I mean, you know, there's also a lot of waste, correct? Right? So just for example, easy, easy example, going outside of the room and turning off the light might actually save your energy, improve your environmental score, and reduce your costs, for example. Um, um, but there are certainly also boundaries to, to, to the extent that you can improve your firm value by improving your environmental, um, to, by, by internalizing the external, externalities. Research suggests we have not found, reached that optimal point yet. Do you see what I mean? Like there's potential for improvement along both dimensions environmental performance as well as financial performance, at some point you would expect it triggers off that you would be more costly than otherwise. 
But what also plays in is increasing looming, I shouldn't say looming, um, increasing government regulation, increasing policy risk of climate change, physical damage, just look at Florida nowadays. Um, that certainly also are direct costs to the company. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Monica, I'm a PhD student. I was curious how, if you've looked at it all, how short-termism short affects greenwashing, because I can imagine short-termism not only uh, prevents companies from looking at environmental and social issues at all, but if they are going to look at it, should, like greenwashing serves to hedge against any sort of kind of short-term reputational risks. Um, and so if there's a way to both look at how that happens and then what some yeah, potential solutions would be. I have looked at greenwashing and I have looked at short-termism. I have not looked at the two in combination. Um, I would expect that the shorter, more short-termistic you are, the less you consider reputational benefits from actually not engaging in greenwashing. So I would expect to see, uh, what is it? A negative correlation between short-termism, no, wait, positive correlation between short-termism and greenwashing. But um, because of paying less attention to these reputational effects that and reputation builds up over time. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jamie Lester. I'm an adjunct professor at the Business School. Uh, aren't you worried that, that tying ESG to a, a positive correlation to stock prices is, is going to backfire? I, mean, I think probably in the last 12 months, the data would show that anti-ESG companies have well outperformed ESG companies. Um, and it seems like you're, and, and there seems to be a bit of a backlash, you know, with the Vivek uh, it you know, the, the, the questioning, you know, from um, you know Congress, Jamie Dimon got a you know ovation and saying, yeah, we're going to keep funding oil and gas, and obviously there's an energy crisis globally now as a result of some of these decisions. Um, and I do think that there was a um, kind of reflective, a reflexive mechanism where, as people divested ESG stocks and created new vehicles to put ESG stocks into, there was a self-reinforcing mechanism that 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 drove prices up. But that's kind of maybe done now. And so I guess the question is, is it necessary for the movement to have that predicate, that ESG responsibility does lead to higher stock prices? When I think, you know, Mr. McIntosh's question is, intuitively you might think it might not, but does that really matter? And, and are you just kind of creating this potential risk to the whole movement uh, by kind of promising that it will, when in fact the data may very well show that it, that it won't? Okay, that was a lot in one comment. Um, let me try to let me try to unpack it in kind of. Um, where should I start? That's a key question. So let me take first uh, one comment about the media, and we also know social media has amplified all all this conversation. There is a lot of. On one hand, it's exciting to see there's more and more ESG practices. Okay, more and more companies and investors are engaging in ESG. On the other hand, that this hype has also led to several companies and investors to come into this space who are not serious and to engage in greenwashing. Going back to your comment about greenwashing. In absence of regulation, this concern is particularly there, correct? Now, um, there are certainly concerns with ESG. And as I mentioned in the beginning, ESG is not always beneficial. Not always. Of course not always. What is always? Right? If you think about innovation and entrepreneurship, we all consider innovation and entrepreneurship to be good for society. That's an average. How many entrepreneurs really succeed? Correct? Right? So, so when I say on average, that research, rigorous research, suggests that there is a positive correlation. Some of them point towards a causal relationship. This is on average. Okay, on that one. But in terms of a lot of the debate in the media currently, I, I think they are missing the point. Um, they are simply missing the point. It's being politicized. And, and I just had a panel discussion yesterday, and I can tell you I'm tired of it. Um, but what we really need is really a shift in focus. The way ESG has been practiced is, as I mentioned, very much confined to the firm level of 
and not necessarily understanding what's the bigger issue. Right? So, if you think about, for example, <coughs> climate crisis, social inequality, social unrest, unrest, these are risks, these are direct risks and costs to companies. So, if the system collapses, that also immediately hurts the pie to some extent. <laughs> So I think we, we actually have just one more question here. Hi. Um, I'm curious if you have any comment on the role of private equity. Um, I saw it mentioned briefly on a slide um, on sort of like this focus on short-term returns over long-term gain. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any comment on kind of how do you regulate private equity um, and these firms that like rapidly acquire companies and like slash employee benefits, et cetera, um, and have massive lobbying capabilities. Like what is there to be done about that, do you think? There's, we know relatively little, correct? Much of the research is on public markets, public capital markets. We know relatively little about the private equity markets, so to speak. and. Um, uh, private businesses in general. Um, let me stop there. Not stop there. Let me let me make a pause there. One thing we also need to consider, and we consider too little, and it, it relates to your question, is as I mentioned, much of the research and our, our understanding is based on public companies and public capital markets. So if we put in place some policies that only affect public capital, mm. how does that potentially then influence companies to go private? And does this potentially worsen the social environmental practices? We don't know. But it is, there is a risk, depending on how we go, that it gets worse, correct, if, if they actually go private. You could also make the argument, if they go private, it releases them from a lot of pressure and they can actually engage in more longer-term investment strategies. It's unclear. It's unclear. Mm 